call the Legislative and Rules Committee meeting together. It's March 26, 2018. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the prior meeting of February 26, uh, 2018? I'll move it. Moved by uh, 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 Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor Garrity. I wasn't sure what we were going to do with that. <laughs> I'm on your committee. Seconded by uh, the Supervisor uh, Driscoll. Any uh, any discussion of those minutes? All those in favor of the minutes as presented, say aye. 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 All right, it's unanimous. Approved. Uh, next to action items, new business. Discussion item, local law regarding opioid uh, litigation. Uh, county attorney is going to address this. Uh, I would like to request an executive session just to discuss the local law, and then the local law will obviously be open um, to the public. Our outside counsel asks us to discuss this in executive session under current litigation. Current litigation. Is there a motion then? Uh, Supervisor Likert? Second to go into executive session. Supervisor Bramer? Is this regarding the law or the litigation? The discussion will be regarding the litigation and why we need the local law, and then we can come out and discuss the local law. Okay. Do I need to do a roll call for moving into executive session? Show of hands. Uh, show of hands for those that um, are approving going into executive session. All right, it appears uh, unanimous with the exception of uh, Ms. Bramer. To discuss the need for it, and we'll come out and actually discuss the local law. It has to do with the litigation and why we need to impose the local law. Oh, the litigation that you guys decide. Yes. All right, we're now in executive session. Motion to come out by Bramer and second by Ed. Second. That's one of the shorter executive sessions I've witnessed. <laughs> Good. Okay, we're back into regular session. No action was taken during executive session. Everybody else, and go ahead. So, uh, the county attorney, do you want to uh, take it from here? Continue. Yes. I was asked in executive session what I think that the county is expending and what we might get back in terms of um, financing this. The county is not going to spend any money. If the county reaches a settlement or gets damages in the lawsuit, outside counsel will take a portion of that. But if the county is not awarded any damages, um, then we pay nothing for this litigation. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. I, I just, um, do, do we run the risk of getting less because we have a county type of um, a smaller piece of the puzzle, right? And we're going to negotiate independently. Is, is there, and, and this is more case history, I think, maybe, but when you think about negotiation, you think of, you know, having a whole mass of people behind you pushing to get something versus this little foreign county as compared to what these guys are facing, the defendants are facing. So do we run the risk of possibly getting less? And this is just a guess, I understand, Mary, but... Are you saying in terms of if we file separately and then the state brings an yeah, action? It's, I, I guess it's all understanding that the implications of filing separately. We could always drop that, right, if we thought we were going to get a better deal with the state? I don't think so. I think it would be dismissed with prejudice. I mean, we couldn't relitigate under a different um, group. I, I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I'll do this offline because I really understand, I want to understand the difference of us filing independently as a county versus us joining the state. Yep. And I see all these other counties doing it. I understand the basis behind it, but I just want to get a little 
better understanding of some of the risks and benefits associated with going both these ways. I hear about the potential benefits, but I don't hear about the risks. So that's really what I'm trying to get my arm on. Hi, go ahead. I just wanted to know if we've already filed. Okay. What's your grammar? Did we already file? We have not filed. Okay. Historically, when the state negotiates for a settlement, um, Warren County has gotten less than if they had gone out on their own and filed a lawsuit. In this particular instance, I, I don't know. I, I can't predict whether that would happen. I tend to believe that the county would get more in damages if they were based on our real damages and not a statewide approach. We, we also, I mentioned in executive session that the county can't be reimbursed for anything that would go above and beyond the cost of the litigation or the cost of the resources that the county has expended. And by filing with the county by themselves, um, and as opposed to filing as statewide, the county is going to get reimbursed for all of those expenses. So the county would not get more from filing with the state because that's not permissible. Supervisor McDevitt. Yeah, just a, <coughs> just a quick observation. I, you know, the statement was made that uh, the, uh, the defendants uh, are the ones that are actually trying to cap uh, damages. Uh, in addition to that, I think the judge that is hearing the case says that this is part of his proposal uh, going forward. Anything that I've read on this, there is that, that, the, that the judge involved has, is, is trying to get, to get to into the end zone on this, so this does not go on for forever in terms of litigation. So, so he's looking for a formula to shorten the suspense and the time frame to, to, to kind of somehow or other whether it's five years or 50 years in the future to to put a cap and an end and an end on the litigation so it's the judge it's probably as well as probably the defendants that are pu putting this argument forward so as far as this particular the uh, proposed local law I mean I, we've heard from our social services people from the sheriff and from other agencies in the county that the opioid crisis is causing significant problems and increasing costs to us. I think this is a good law for us to pursue passing. All right. Supervisor Wong. I'll make a motion. That we should right. uh, proceed with this. This has been made, uh, introducing proposal of the law number three entitled Municipal Opioid Cost Recovery and Public Nuisance Legislation. And that motion is to move this on to the Board of Supervisors, whereby they will uh, hold a public hearing on this matter on May 18, 2018, at 10, 10 a.m. Uh, seconded by uh, Supervisor Bramer. Um, all those in favor of moving this forward in the way that I just mentioned, say aye. 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 Here's unanimous. <coughs> motion passes. Next item. <coughs> Next item is a letter of support for plastic bag mitigation, and I'll have Supervisor Bramer speak to that issue. Sure. Last summer, we, the Legislative and Rules Committee, passed a resolution supporting uh, statewide legislative action on the plastic bag issue. That went through our committee and got up to the board, but was uh, did not pass the full board. So over time, uh, looking at a little bit more, looking at the governor's task force report that came out in January just a couple months ago, it seemed like a good time to try to get that passed again. But most people that I've talked to in our county do support some sort of uh, legislative solution towards the plastic single-use plastic bag issue where the, the really thin, flimsy plastic bags. Um, and it looks like the state may be going in that direction. There is a proposal by Senator Kruger right now to ban those particular bags. Her bill also has some other aspects in it that I'm not sure the county um, would be supportive of. In any event, I talked to Supervisor Dickinson and he asked that legislative and rules hold off because he would like to look at this more in depth in the environmental concerns.
long-term remedy. Well, I am suggesting that we pass it off to the Environmental Concerns Committee. Unless anyone has any strong desire to pass this resolution, um, which would be a similar letter to our state legislators. But I think it's, I think it's, it'll be wise to have the environmental concerns look at it in more in depth, and then um, we could pass that something out of that committee up to the full board, or if they think it needs to come back to here, we could do that too. Okay. Right. Thoughts, discussion? All right, seeing none. Uh, what does the county uh, wish to do? Uh, Put it on the environmental concerns agenda. You want us to yeah, make yeah. A, a, a motion and a second to move this on to the environmental concerns committee? I think it. I don't think it needs a motion. I think it just. Yeah, I think Supervisor Dickinson. He's he's, he's well aware. Put it on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, fine. Good enough for me too. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Bramer, for mm -hmm. your effort there. Uh, next on the items are some referrals and some pending items. Uh, we had this before us previously. We got a couple of resolutions for us to consider uh, from the Lake George Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and um, so um, I believe that uh, Fred Vogel who was the board president of Lake George Chamber of Commerce, and Gina Minster, who was the executive director of the Lake George Chamber of Commerce, is here to try and elaborate, explain what these are in reference to. So if it's okay with the committee, I'll, I'll give the floor to Fred or Gina, whoever wishes to speak. Good morning, everybody. My name is Fred Vogel from the Lake George Chamber of Commerce. I, um, was, it was brought up to our board a couple of months ago, uh, these two issues, that New York State is trying to add some more regulations, and our board unanimously were against both of these regulations, um, specifically with regard to the uh, tip credit that we currently use in the, in the restaurant industry. Um, we handed out a, a paper to you guys this morning, and I think it, you probably none of you had a chance to read it all. But um, basically, what that shows is that as the um, as the unemployment rates or as the labor rates are raised, it's a regressive um, regulation on our industry, and that we decrease in about a 14 percent. Uh, decrease for every dollar of minimum wage that's uh, put upon us. So as you can see, we have an industry in the restaurant industry that, you know, and Matt can probably attest to this as well, is that we, the businesses are doing well. There's people in our, in our, in our operations, but at the end of the day, it's not a high profiting business. You have to do an awful lot of work to make a very little amount of money and regulations like these are directed right at us to hurt our operations. We, on a daily basis, if you watch any TV, um, Empire State Development is putting out commercials saying, come grow your business in New York State. And uh, this, these two regulations definitely do not fit that um, goal for ourselves. So I'm willing to answer any questions, but I, what we collectively feel they're regressive and not good for our business. Right, I have one. Can you, because the title of this is the resolution to oppose the proposed New York State Department of Labor call-in pay proposal. What is labor call-in pay? So right now, if in um, maybe the county attorney might be able to help me a little bit, but I, I think that there is, a, there's a, if I was to call somebody in to work today, I have to give them a minimum of four hours of work. If, and no, the, the new regulation yes. says that if I call somebody in today, I have to give them a minimum of six hours. So it's just basically saying, hey, you automatically have to pay an employee an extra two hours to call them in. And at least, you know, from the Boathouse restaurant standpoint, we are extremely weather dependent. 
a weekend in lake george with sun versus a weekend in lake george with rain are completely different i might need ten servers on a sunny saturday and i might need three on a bad saturday so being able to have the flexibility to call in labor at an affordable rate is is good the other you know the other factor for me as a as a business owner is with the millennial workforce if they don't want to come in they're not going to come in and if they want to come in they'll come in so we don't have a lot of uh, give and take in that world as well so the market i think sort of uh, floats itself out with regard to the issue and not and there's no need to bring in more regulation to adjust it it just doesn't seem like the demand uh, is there right now john i have a question uh, Yes, uh, Supervisor Garrity. As I understand, it, you 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 have to pay call in to your servers now. If you call, well, no. If I call somebody in, I have to pay them for a minimum minimum of four hours. This right is, now. Right now. I oh. like I don't think I can have somebody come into my work and only work them for two hours. I don't think that that's a labor. I think that's a labor law that's been in existence as long as I've been in business. So we you know we currently don't schedule anybody for less than a four hour shift. Okay. It's my understanding though a lot of the servers aren't in favor of this either. Are they these laws or are they are? I you know, I really haven't had any discussion with our servers about it. We're closed for the winter, so I don't have a lot of interaction with them. Um, John Carr, he has he has spoke a lot with his staff on it, um, and they don't want it either. They like the flexibility. Yeah, that's kinda of what I heard at the basketball tournament there's some people down near Albany and they were telling me that what are we doing about this in our county but I didn't think it had a lot of traction yeah but maybe okay another regulation supervisor Driscoll are there any regions in the uh, in New York State that you're aware of that are in favor of it it seems to be generated out of New York City but I don't even think that the uh, restaurants in New York City are in favor of it okay oh, okay that answers that question. Yes, Supervisor Weil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I have a lot of questions, right, in, in terms of why this even started and why this has come up. But um, let's get back to this four hours versus six hours, and you're talking about wait staff. Um, their minimum wage is significantly less than regular workers, right? So they pay, what is I'll it? I'll accept that there is, and that's part of, the one resolution there's a tip credit so there's you know and I'm not going to be able to give the exact numbers but if, if the minimum wage is X you're allowed to give them a credit of a certain number of dollars per hour that's an assumption of what they earned in that hour in tip form okay now they're supposed to declare that right so at the end of their shift they're supposed to say I made $45 or I made a hundred dollars some do some don't you know 14-year-old bus guy is clocking out and he's running out the door. So you get some of that information, you don't get some of that information, and that's the way that tip credit is in there to help balance that minimum wage. So if I may just right, rephrase good. that, based but on... I'm are sorry. you on 1B already? Because I, I was talking sure. about both, but... Well, both. I'm on 1A. There's a difference? Well, okay. Well, is there any further discussion on 1A? All right. Now, and and I'm not sure what we're going to do with these. Um, I, I know that uh, Supervisor Garrity would like us to wait and get some um, feedback from our new um, administrator. What? No, no. We're talking. We're on this regional chamber. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. You were talking about another one. Oh no, I'm talking about something else. Yeah. All right. So we're on this chamber stuff. All right. So now, for discussion purposes, now come back for a vote as to whether we want to move this forward or not. Is there any further discussion on 1A? Yes. Okay. I I have not seen the proposed legislation. I didn't I didn't look at it. I've only had a chance to look at your letter. And my my concern is. If you're a working mom and you get called in and you send your kids to daycare, you usually have to pay for that whole day. So if you're called in and then they scrap you at three hours or four, I mean, it just seems to me that there should be some balance there. And 
I don't know if an extra two hours that they're proposing in the legislation is, is what that's aimed at doing. Okay. Well, from my perspective, I just kind of feel it's aimed at adding another layer of regulation onto our businesses. And we're a fragile industry. It's not a strong industry. Talk, well, to, the, talk to the bankers whose bank accounts are big, it's definitely not the restaurant guys. To 1A? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I believe I was going after 1A. Okay. Uh, and this is the call-in uh, pay where they get six hours versus four. And what I'm trying to get to is an understanding of what truly that economic impact is for those additional two hours. And is it the state minimum wage, which for example, maybe $10 an hour, and I apologize, I don't know what that is today. but. The wait staff, I believe, gets paid something different. And what I'm trying to understand is what is the, the true economic impact of that? And I'm, I'm a pro-business guy, don't get me wrong, but I also have a heart for the people here who have to survive in the off-season, right? And during the season, right? So um, I want to understand, these extra two hours, you pay them at that lower wage, Right, so you're really only paying them an additional twelve dollars or unless something they, like unless that. Unless they don't make, unless they don't make enough tips to meet the minimum wage, then the restaurant has to pay them up to the minimum wage. So, for example, if a restaurant asks five servers to come in for the day, and it's a complete downpour, and you only do five dinners, and nobody makes enough money, in theory, the restaurant is supposed to pay the difference in the tip credit that that server does not make, so Fred, that they do make minimum wage. Fred, that. that's the current law? That's the current law. And this basically is, is just adding more dollars to that, and the paper that we have in front of you today, when you have a chance to uh, look at it, will demonstrate that it's, it's a regressive situation. The more we burden a business with uh, automatic pay raises, it's a, like a 14% reduction you're going to see restaurants closing. There's the, the margins are that small. Yes, Supervisor Bramer. Are these, um, one of the things in your letter says about that this does not um, appreciate the impacts of the tourism and hospitality industry. Are these, I'm assuming then that these bills are about all kinds of different industries. Yes, and, and I think they're, you know, from our area's standpoint, um, with regard to the scheduling and the call-in, you know, right now we try to do a month out schedule, but the reality is is that that schedule, we have a, a, a program called Hot Schedules. Well, Hot Schedules means that it's live for every server that gets to look at it, and they're changing and swapping shifts all the time, and it just has to get a manager's approval. So. If someone doesn't have a babysitter, they can type in a text message to all the other servers in one clip and see who wants to pick up their shift or says, you know, something happened, I'm free tonight, who wants to give a shift out? So technology is really doing a lot of this already and I don't really see the need for it, but, you know, it's from a standpoint of using the your power, I think that you guys could find a middle ground if it, if it looks like the legislation is going to go through, that there could be an area of tourist, you know, a tourist area that is subject to seasonal business uh, excluded from the law. To your, if I could add to that, so this particular revising the call and pay requirements, it's the minimum wage order for miscellaneous industries and occupations. So for instance, it would not affect the healthcare industry. So the healthcare industry could call you in for that four-hour shift but not have to pay for it. So whereas the hospitality and tourism falls in under that industry, not that miscellaneous industry. So like if you called in someone to plow, you know, you wouldn't be subject because of where they're, where they fall in the minimum wage order. They're not under miscellaneous industry. Does that make sense? Don't get a question. Yes, uh, Supervisor Beatty. Yeah, um, I'm just taking an old view. We were rated the second worst state in the country for doing business. We were rated the most regulated state in the country for doing business. When I see certain regulations, additional regulations, 
I cringe. I mean, we're driving people out of the state left and right. We we spent $40 million telling everybody how New York State's great for business. Come on, come to Matt's Tavern, come to the boathouse. Yet, we continually overburden all these businesses with additional regulation, which shrinks their profit margin so that why even stay in business if I gotta work 60 hours to make 20 grand a year? It doesn't make sense. 60 hours a week. So uh, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna support the Vogels on this. I'm gonna support the fact that, you know, when we go from four hours minimum to six hours minimum, that may not sound like a lot to people in here, but I used to be a part owner at Sunnyside and I can tell you that it does affect things. Uh, and I remember we had a the person who did our books up at Sunnyside said, how the hell, this was his first statement, this guy was a big finance guy in Massachusetts, he said, how the hell can anybody make any money in New York State? Oh, look at the regulation. He goes, if I ever knew there was this many, I never would have been a partner in this thing. But anyway, so I'm going to support the Vogels on this, but a bigger picture is I'm against going from four hours to six hours minimum. I know it doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people in this room, but I know that Matt Sokol and other people have been in the business. It is meaningful, and the margins are that thin. So if we can do one thing to stop this over-regulated state, then I'm all for it. We need to cut regulations back, not keep adding more to it. That's my position. Anybody else like to speak to uh, uh, Proposal 1A? All right, uh, seeing no others that wish to speak to Proposal 1A, is there a motion of support to, where would this go next, to the Board of Supervisors? Yes. To move our opposition to the proposed New York State Department of Labor call and pay proposed regulations, which are basically revising the call and pay requirements of the minimum wage order for miscellaneous industries and occupations, 12 NYCRR Part 142, and so forth. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. When is the state planning to move on this? I'm Any aware. idea? I'm not aware. Because I'd like a little more time to kind of understand. This is a complicated issue. It is. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if it's appropriate to try to table this until our next meeting and whether that is going to create well, we don't issue. have to table it. We just don't have to do any action on this. If it appears the consensus of the board wishes more time for consideration, so next month's uh, legislative rules committee, I don't think we have to make a motion. It's just that it still stays active for discussion. We're just not going to take an action. How does the board feel on that? Let me. I don't like it. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Leggett. Thank you. That. You know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to oppose a certain action. Is there an action that we could support that's out there? Is anybody else countering each well, other? Per personally, I don't see, in my, in my business, I don't see the need for anything like this. We're, we're dealing in fall sm far smaller of a window than two weeks as it is right now. Like, people are jockeying schedules around left and right always. And so to hold the business into a locked-in schedule two weeks out is a big deal to me because a lot happens in two weeks. That's 20% that's of my entire year in reality because we got a 10-week season. Well, the other thing to consider, I think, Fred, is that is this part of the budget and is this moving <coughs> forward in the Assembly and the Senate and the Governor's budget and so forth? I mean, is this part of the budget approval process? Because if it is, then it's going to be addressed before April 1st or thereabouts, right? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware of where it stands. Well, I don't know that it's in the budget or not, but we'll, we'll get more information on that. Yeah, Supervisor I mean, Charity? From what I'm hearing, it could potentially lead to less jobs. Potentially, I mean, uh, you know, coming from manufacturing, it, it was tough enough when you paid four-hour call-ins for folks, and you know, they. But to raise it to six, it seems excessive to me to, to have to pay for six hours because that doesn't mean they have to be there, does it, Fred? No. I mean, somebody could live in uh, Blue Mountain Lake, and they and you call them, you're going to pay them six hours whether they're four, two, or one, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I just think, I, I got to agree with Supervisor Beatty, I just think it's a, a, a 
undo legislation put on our service industry that it's not needed at this time because minimum wage keeps going up, correct? I mean, and you have to hear the minimum wage. Is that correct, Fred? Yes. So minimum wage is going to, it just keeps rising every year. And I don't think they're exempt from minimum wage. And, you know, I think the gap's there. So now I, I, I agree with the, the industry, those restaurant industry folks. I don't think it's necessary. Yes, yes, I, I just uh, want to say I do go along with the uh, Chairman, um, I mean, um, Supervisor, Supervisor Gary and, and, and Supervisor Beatty. I, I, I just think it's a <coughs> undo, uh, just another layer of uh, just, uh, you know, stepping in and hurting um, of such a fragile seasonal business that we have here. Uh, Supervisor Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With all due respect, uh, we already have a regulation, right? So um, I don't think we're adding a new one. We're just modifying that regulation. I, I hear you, and I'm just not sure where to go yet. And I wish I had some more time to kind of understand this because I do. I, I have a bleeding heart sometimes, right? For the people here, right? We talked about trying to move this um, this county in the Lake George region into a, a, a year-round. Um, tourist center so you know one of the, the reasons for that is um, so that we can continue to employ our people year-round versus just in the summertime so uh, I, I guess I'm conflicted and I'd like to understand a little bit more about how this fits that big picture all right trying to get a sense of the direction here I mean for the members who are voting uh, in on this and it's a committee administration way of doing things McGowan and Garrity and Stroud, by the way, feel that this is excessive legislation. It doesn't benefit our local tourism business and would oppose this, but that's only three votes. I'd like to hear from Supervisor Soko, who runs the business. At this point, I don't know if I should abstain from anything nowadays, but... Uh, hey, I can relate to that. There is... Uh, <laughs> 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 we'll go have coffee later. <laughs> um, it, it is very convoluted, and unless you're in a, you know, I feel for you too because you don't understand it. But you know, we just went through a situation. I talked to another um, another restaurant owner in Saratoga. He's a good friend of mine, and we were talking about uh, labor. And come to find out, I was paying two dollars more for servers uh, than I was supposed to for ever since we started because. There is a difference of pay for, for servers as opposed to bartenders even. So that, that tip credit adjustment that we keep referring to is if it's a slow night for the server, um, they should be making the minimum wage, which is the 950 or whatever. So if they don't make that, then we as the owners have to make sure that they get to that point. Okay. So. I think, in a nutshell, what they're trying to do is to get up to the McDonald's standards where you're paying $15 an hour. So for the next five years, there is, and I believe it's this law, where they're trying to get the servers and bartenders to that point. But there's also the other side of the coin where, you know, there is that flexibility that Mr. Vogel spoke to where, you know, they make some decent money. They make some really decent money. And depending on what they want to declare, depends on a situation like, like uh, Supervisor Bramer brought up where, you know, daycare is X amount of dollars, but they know well and good that they're going to make up way more than that serving. So, you know, I just, I am one of those, when I first came to this uh, county, I said, uh, the less government involvement, the better off we're going to be. We've got to run this place like a business, and if we don't, if we don't approve this, then we're not doing what we say. Okay. There's four votes. I think I need six. <coughs> right? Is in the majority of the committee, and that's yes, Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter. Uh, Supervisor McCormick. Thank you very much. I uh, I uh, would uh, uh, basically support the the resolution as as put down here. Uh, I actually know a, uh, uh, a server that works at your restaurant. Okay, and uh, she. Uh, uh, 
busy nights in July and August, uh, September. Uh, she walks out with a with a bucket load of cash in her pocket. Okay, so uh, so I, I think she would be she would support uh, your 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 uh, resolution. So uh, again, I've spoken to a person that actually sees it, lives it, and uh, and li likes the system the way it is. Yeah. Supervisor Driscoll. Yeah. I, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I grew up in the restaurant industry, uh, Red Fox Steakhouse and Red Fox Motel in uh, Foxborough, Massachusetts, a mile down the street from Gillette Stadium. And um, uh, the men and women who worked uh, for my family uh, did well. Um, they also, uh, to uh, Supervisor Bramer's point, I, I agree with that. They also knew what they were getting into and and um, had to have a uh, plan B and a plan C as far as backup and, and daycare and all those types of things. Um, I too, you know, uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Volk's comments and, and I, because of that, I'm going to, uh, to support it also. Okay. So we do have, it appears, at least six votes to move this forward to the Board of Supervisors in accord with the way I read. So any further discussion? Um, and let's put it to a vote. A motion to move this forward to the Board of uh, Supervisors. It's a resolution again to oppose the proposed New York State uh, Department of Labor call in pay proposed regulations. <coughs> so do a roll call vote or just show a hand? We need choice. All those in favor of moving this opposition forward to the Board of Supervisors, please raise your hands. All right, so Leggett is in favor. Are you in favor? Wait a second. What favor? You're in favor. I'm in favor? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I might have hit my head really hard this weekend. Now he's so in favor. Where was the favor? I thought he just threw you a mulligan. Who <laughs> <laughs> was in favor? He's in Spain. Oh, Stan. Okay. Right. As am I. Driscoll oh. is in favor. Ostrow is in favor. McDivitt's in favor. So we have our needed six votes, at least six votes to move this forward. Thank you. Now, I just want to make my vote known. I'm, I don't know enough right now to really feel like I can support that, but just talk about just doing an exemption for our signal business. A no vote. I'll do some more research right. before the full board meeting. Okay. Thanks. All right, Fred, uh, would you move us on to uh, 1B? 1B is the Lake George Regional Chamber of Commerce and CBB resolution number two of 2018 resolution to oppose the proposed elimination of the minimum wage tip credit currently being evaluated by the commissioner of the New York State Department of Labor. Uh, we had trouble understanding exactly what that was, so would you help us with that? Yeah, so I kind of um, dove into that a little bit when we were discussing 1A, but <clears throat> I think everybody in the room probably gets it now, is there's a minimum wage, the tip credit is a allows a restaurant to not uh, physically put into the paycheck the dollars for the tip credit. Um, and the state is trying to eliminate that um, process in the payroll. Um, I think that the best example is um, Davidson Brothers Restaurant. We watched them do that about a year and a half or two years ago and it's another disaster not only from the business side but also from the customer side. Uh, I don't think it, it went over anywhere. The, the staff didn't like it um, and the customers didn't like having that ability to thank somebody for the good service or say, you know what, you didn't quite do the job that we were expecting. So um, from a standpoint, from our Lake George Regional Chamber of Commerce standpoint, we, um, we feel like just adding these things are, are adding to a difficult uh, business environment that we have already. And it just adds to the adds to regulations that we don't need. It doesn't seem to be a, a problem that everybody's screaming about, or at least in in my world that I hear about it. All right, questions or thoughts from the committee, uh, Supervisor Bramer? Thanks. I'm glad you brought up Davidson's. I'm from Glen Falls, and I kind of watched that, but I didn't know what 
has happened with that? Did, are they part of your board? Do they give you input? They're not part of our board, um, you know, but but we have spoke with, you know, I just personally have spoke with them uh, regarding it. And, uh, you know, they, my wife sent a nice thing that said something like, if you're, if you're going to uh, get the best fruit, you got to go out on a limb, right, to the Davidson Brothers. And so it was nice that they tried it because I think that this, this issue has not, this isn't the first time that this issue is being floated for, for passing. It's been something that's been out there for a while. Um, and I don't really know what the push is for it because I don't see a fundamental problem in the, in the system that is, exists right now. Um, so, but the more people that I've talked to about the Davidson Brothers issue it, are the customers. The customers thought that the servers were getting the raw end in the non tip right, Supervisor Brown? Thanks. Did Davidson switch back? Okay. Oh, they did. Okay. Supervisor Sol. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will say in that regard that we always we we like our local brews, so we we dealt with Davidson Brothers. We had a tap. As soon as that hit, I did not sell any more Davidson beer. The one thing that has me concerned is that I did try and research this law to determine what it's all about, and I came across the car washers. Remember? So is what you're proposing, Fred, strictly for uh, the hospitality industry as opposed to car washers? You mean what the state is proposing? Yeah. I think that is, it, I'm understanding that it's just a restaurant thing, but I don't know if any other industries have a tip credit in their payroll laws. I mean, I didn't even know that car washers depended on tips. Well, I, I'm a very guilty person here. but. Um, we, we have tipped those brushes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The but touchless ones. So I, I wouldn't want to take some segments of the society out of here that might be deserving of this because their situation is, is, is unique. But I do agree with you in terms of one member on this committee that what happened to David's and so forth and talking to waiters and waitresses locally, they're not in favor of this. So either am I, and I favor your opposition. But um, so, but I, I I wonder if we ought to narrow it down to the industries that apply to us, and 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 not really other industries where they might be more deserving of something like this. I'm not sure. We can look into whether or not this covers other industries, okay. but I think you'll also see that this paper that we handed out really is, I think, directed a little bit more at this re resolution than the first resolution where that adding those dollars to our minimum wage factor will just create a decrease in the number of restaurants that can survive on in on today's world. Yeah. Supervisor Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I apologize for maybe asking a naive question. Why, why can a, uh, a county dictate its uh, sales tax uh, percentage but not have the opportunity to um, to weigh in on this on a county by county basis. If you understand my question, I think I do. Yeah. In other words, it doesn't seem to be something that'd be good for Warren County. Yeah, other counties. It might be good for West parts of the county city, or Westchester. Yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. Yes. So this resolution is just to impose the current legislation in front of the state. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm I'm in favor of this. You know, bring a motion. If you, if it's time. Yeah. Yes. Supervisor. No. No. Yeah. Thank you, no. Uh, I thought it was clear in this question that we're talking about uh, tips versus your, your paycheck. Yeah. 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 Not tip, tip credit is basically, and, and I think the number is, um, right now a, a minimum wage tipped employee gets seven fifty an hour, and then the tip credit makes up that in the difference of, of, to get to minimum wage. So the assumption that that tipped person made at least that much money 
in that time frame to justify that they're making minimum wage. And if they're not, so let's say a server came in and made zero, the tip credit will come out of the restaurant's bank account as opposed to being a credit on their pay stuff. So, uh, if I understand you right, if the minimum wage is seven fifty, and they make seven dollars tip, when they walk out the door with fourteen fifty or fifteen dollars, right? Seven fifty and seven fifty and tips would be fifteen bucks. And minimum is nine. But the tip credit is the tip credit assures that a server will make at least minimum wage. And they'll take away the tip. So the restaurant would go to a point where if we pay minimum wage, there's no, you don't need to tip. Okay, now it really confused. Yeah. They walk out with $15, but well, my 15 question was, if they, make, if they get a $7 tip, well, you've got your seven, or you've got your seven fifteen tip, so basically you're going to walk out with, but you don't have to pay your pension. Oh, yeah. No. You got to pay the, you know, what this does is this, this says that a restaurant's automatically going to pay minimum wage to a server despite the fact that they either get or they're don't get tips. <laughs> so either they're going to end up with, in, in this scenario, we raise the minimum wage so each restaurant's now got to pay four or five dollars more per hour per server, per bartender, per bus person. And the paper that was put out today, I don't know if Gina's got one that she could give you, but um, <coughs> that would show that for every dollar increase in minimum wage, we see about a 14% regression in the restaurant's survivability in, in the state, or even, the, I can't remember if that was national or state that that study was done. So. It's basically making more, raising the minimum wage, and is the public going to say, okay, the server now gets more, we don't have to tip, or is the public going to say, yeah, they're making another 550 an hour minimum wage, but we're still going to tip it out, but the restaurant's going to say, well, I can't sell a burger for ten dollars anymore. I got to sell a burger for seventeen because I'm paying five dollars more per hour for every tipped employee that we have on the floor. So you're going to want to you're going to want to staff less, consequently giving worse customer service, and it <coughs> becomes a downward spiral. Just one more. So the tips would remain the same. The idea of the legislation is that the minimum wage for essentially. So so either get tips. Well, I don't know if I understand your question exactly. Tips. Somebody makes. Uh, I, I, I pay my way to college working in the cash room. I so make thousands of dollars. Getting free. Getting tips. Right. Getting tips. Getting so tips. and I would get twenty five. I make three hundred dollars a week in tips and twenty five dollars a week in So if you're going to say, it, is it going to stay the same? I would probably say, probably not, because the restaurant will be forced to charge more for the meal, and you're going to look and say, well, I just sat down and had a burger and a Pepsi and it cost me $20 as opposed to what it might cost right now, $12 to $15. But the, the, the difference for the server would be no. the same. It, I mean, say I was... No, I don't need to get to get money to get there. But they're going to get 20 bucks plus they're going to get more than their minimum wage. Yes. Okay, so or, maybe like or maybe not. not. Yeah. Now that you know that they're getting paid in their wage, you may not tip them. All right, we'd like to move this along. Supervisor Leggett. Yeah, this is a long time the discussion that's gone on for probably the past 50 years at least. You know, should you have workers that work for tips as it is? Because basically an industry is passing off labor costs to the, to the customer to make up a, a difference to it. So it's been a long standing discussion on these parts. And as, as you just pointed out, Fred, that at the, at the table, a customer will make the decision on you know, should I be paying for the food that's in front of me that includes a fair wage or should I pay less for that food in front of me that does not include a fair wage or pull out of my pocket and add to it with tips. Traditionally we've always done it with tips. We're very comfortable with that. Some societies are not uh, but we've always lived and died by that sort here. So that's really you know, part of the big issue that's that's under this, and should we change it or not? I think 
you know, it sounds like, in the big picture of things, this is going to be a move towards getting rid of a tip system altogether. That's their goal. Yeah, yeah. In my, in my world, in my experience, and I know a lot of people that are waiters and waitresses, they make a lot more than a minimum wage. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially, you know, in the summer here, I mean, so they're doing, you know, nobody's complaining. Uh, Supervisor McGowan. You know, it almost sounds like what the state's trying to do is say, hey, look, we want to track that money more so we can get the sales tax. Because, you know, um, you know, they, I'm sure a couple dollars came to fall off at the end uh, of the night there. Of, of claiming. And, you know, like I said, I, I think it's all, uh, you know, a control of them being able to say this. I personally like the, uh, the effect of um, tipping the person because if I don't get the service that I feel I deserve, you know, I will explain to them that, you know, normally I tip 15%, uh, you know, on, on fair service. Anything above that is, you know, I'm a heavy tipper because I'm in the service industry and I enjoy, you treat me well, I'm going to treat you well. So uh, I tend to, to feel, and I state that at the beginning, so I feel my service is usually better. So. I think it's a regulatory control from the state to uh, uh, basically uh, try to collect more tax money, and I'm and I'm not. I, I'd rather keep it the same because they they do work hard and they deserve they deserve their money. All right. Is there enough members of the committee to move this to the board of supervisors to vote on this resolution to oppose the proposed elimination of the minimum wage tip credit currently being evaluated by the commissioner of the New York State Department of Labor? <coughs> uh, motion to move forward, moved by uh, 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 Supervisor Wild, seconded by Supervisor McGowan. All those in favor? One, one last discussion. Oh, yes, yeah, discussion. Yeah. Sorry. That one, one other thing that on these, when you have resolutions opposing things, I always feel that you're not moving anything forward. You know, that it's always better to have a resolution that supports something. So yeah, yeah we support the way it currently is. I would agree that you're coming through the back door, that. that's how it sounds, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, all those in favor of uh, what? Well, I just voted. Oh, oh, raise your hand, please. Oh. I'm going to go by raise that hand, so those who are in favor. Uh, this is of opposing. <laughs> opposing, yes. Okay, those uh, those uh, opposed? We're, we're supporting no change. Abstaining? Supporting no change. Total abstaining. All the rest are in favor. All right, motion passes. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Fred. Um, Can you give me some information about two other resolutions that are going to come down the pipeline? Sure. I mean, the 488. like pre reading <coughs> Um, there's two things. One is um, the APA is seeking comments on white-facing core plans. So the goal is that um, they are putting money into order, the state is putting money into order to... Um, uh, yeah, we saw uh, Yeah, so it's just, yeah, okay, yep. great. Um, that, that's a good one. And then the other one is um, there is some, um, there, I, I've added information here on um, the 180 uh, hour minimum rule for our schools and going to a full year um, economy within our school system. And they, the, school, the school districts would get to choose whether they want to change that. 180 and days. Yeah, the 180 days. And um, it's, I think that is there. We just have a letter from our own association, but in here it shows how Warren County, 60% um, of our business is done in the summer, and if our school summer were to change, um, our, la our labor force would be impacted as well as our whole summer season. So there's just some, um, like 60% of our summer business, 40% is the rest of the year, but ours is due through August. And that Warren County, um, the other stat is that, um, the 11% of our tax sales taxes that we collect are in March through May, 60% are June through August, 21% September to November, and then 37% December through February. So it would also drastically impact our sales tax collection if we didn't indeed have the summer season that we have. So it's just information so that you know, but each school district will get to um, actually vote on that themselves. 
and we would want you know people here to know about that. So that's all I'm looking at. All right. I'm leaving all that behind. Yeah, and we'll get Amanda. <laughs> we'll get it distributed. Okay, great. Thank, right, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one last item on the thing. Some people want me to close this by noon. Um, I, I'd like to just talk okay. about number two real quick. Yes. Yeah. Number two being uh, the, the change in the foil. The I, I'd like to see us wait to the new county administrator comes in so he can read over this information to see what impact it may have on, on his duties. Well, it's a uh, Supervisor Bramer's thing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any problem with um, putting it on next month's uh, Legislative Rules Committee meeting and discussing it then, or? My proposal does add some, a lot of the departments to the county administrator, but I really do think that that is going to streamline the process and give um, everyone a more clear path as to how they get documents and how they're pushed back out to the to the people. But I do not, I do not have any problems waiting. Yeah, we'll get it right on the, I'll make sure right, thank when you. it comes in. Something like change. Yeah, change the, the red, I tried, change. so I did this, and I tried to put everything that I changed in red with um, <coughs> stuff that I was deleting in brackets and the new words in italics. Okay. Okay. Yes, County Attorney. I made one change to that document not realizing that Supervisor Bramer had already made the changes. Um, so under the appeals process, I was going to ask the committee to change that to the county administrator, but I don't know if that makes sense with all of Supervisor Bramer's edits. Uh, Are these, the, what you have here, Amanda, is this mine or? That's yours. Okay. Yeah, I think that that would be hard to have the appeal person be the county administrator. And I think the state law says it's supposed to be the, you know, the body. So I even thought about, well, maybe we should make the full board the person who responds to any appeals, but that seems really unwieldy. So I left it with the chairman and just added a provision saying that the full board should receive documentation of the appeals and the decision made, just like the Committee on Open Government gets all copies of all of the appeals. I don't see why we shouldn't also know what's happening on our FOIL process. Okay, there appears to be... Um, you uh, could digest that and we'll talk about it next month. Yes, I thank you. Is that okay with the committee? Yeah, fine. All right. Is there anything else? I just have one other thing. I received a, an email this morning from the State Forest Rangers and uh, the forest rangers are concerned about the state purchasing of more land and not uh, they're asking for more rangers they would like to see the ranks of the forest rangers uh, increase by 40 from 135 statewide to 175 uh, they're asking each town and perhaps counties within uh, the adirondack park to uh, support this i mean i know we we rely on the rangers up in this area quite quite a bit and uh, um, it's, it comes up from time to time and they're just asking uh, for support. So far they have 40 towns that uh, have supported it. All right, discussion on, uh, they're talking about reducing the number? Increasing. Increasing. You would like to increase the number? 135 currently to 175. So increasing at 40? people? 40. Discussion? Uh, go ahead, Supervisor uh, Leggett. The DEC has seen reduction in numbers throughout the years yeah. uh, on, on a lot of these, these things here. I don't know what it was that before the 135. But will we be getting the same at the town level of what you just received? Yeah, I'll, I can have Amanda. I'll forward it to Amanda and then she'll send it out to the full board. It just an email came in this morning. Yes, yeah, Supervisor Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can we just ask for an understanding of what additional services are going to be provided or what services will be eliminated won't be with this additional resource? It's with with the increase in the state lands that the state has purchased a lot more state lands. There's rescues, there's searches, there's more, more uh, avenues where the rangers will have to be out covering these state lands and without increased staffing. I mean, I, I don't know how many acres they've increased it in the last year with the forest ponds and all that 
land coming on, they're asking for more help with searches and um, result, resulting in more state land, more searches, more rescue incidents that tax their small force. And they do have a small workforce. So that's what they're asking for. Yeah, so asking for 175 people to... From 135, they're increasing 40 statewide. Yeah, and that's statewide. Statewide. So that's... Force still, range. That's still thin. It's thin, yeah. Yeah, I can support that. Anybody else? After our last full board meeting when we were talking about the pilot thing, um, somebody emailed me about the number of acres in Warren County that we have a forest reserve, and it's a lot more than I thought, and something like 35% of the county's land area. Well, that could get us on to 480 and 480A. <laughs> That's another whole topic, though. All right, forest rangers. Uh, I'll make a motion we support. All right, motion that. made by Supervisor Garrity, seconded by uh, Supervisor McDivitt. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Okay, anybody opposed? Abstaining? All right, unanimous. All right, we'll send that. I'll get it out. All right, but Sorry. real quick, um, there is another discussion item that came up via phone uh, to talk about 480 and 480A. Um, it's not an easy one to grasp, but uh, Supervisor Simpson no. and Supervisor Leggett have both um, brought up the topic in kind of different ways. So um, that's the one where we're talking about some one percent. I don't know. I got lost in this. And I also know that the Association of Towns did it, and and it's on page eight of that pamphlet that we got, and. And um, the Association of Town just says that it needs some tweaking before they can support it. I don't know what that means. I don't know what they're talking about. What packet are you Supervisor on? Simpson? The, the big issue is packet here. Everybody supports the concepts that are in that, that legislation. Amanda Simpson. Under 480, 480B, or 48. No. So the issue is the one percent tax that uh, <coughs> could be created some tax. Uh, right now, you know, in 2004, Senator Little successful with legislation that the dog uh, brought a lot of towns up to reimbursement level of all the one percent. So they weren't getting any reimbursement, then they got all the one percent. So that's where this one percent came from from previous legislation. Now they're coming up with a new plan, this 480D, which would lower the amount of acreage that would be required to enter into this exemption. And the state would make all any towns that saw more than a 1% tax. Some towns, that's not a big deal. Some towns will see more. But there's a lot of towns and I think the Association of Towns' position, the best I can read it, is okay, but you've got to guarantee these towns that might lose revenue that the state will make it up. And if you put that clause in there, we could support this. But it's not there. And right now, from what I understand, 480, 480A, 480B, or whatever version is out there, has been pulled from uh, um, the budget bill, at least, uh, before the Assembly and the Senate, and it's still, the governor is still proposing it, right? No, the, the Senate passed a one-house bill that supported <coughs> this legislation as long as they made the 1% of 480Bs, or which is the 40D, the 40As and the 40As. So you would support the Senate version? I would support the Senate version. All right, uh, Supervisor Leggett. You yeah. had a discussion with uh, Mr. Stegman. That, that's right, because this is a confusing issue. What is a 1% tax shift? How does this affect the town? So before you, um, we had received something from the Assessors Association saying uh, oppose this. Several counties in the state had um, passed resolutions opposing such a thing. And as you, as you know, I'm more in support of something than opposing it. The town of Chester has about $744 million worth of uh, assessed land altogether. That uh, um, within, right now, between all of our 480, the Fisher Act and the 480A, 
the existing legislation for forest, uh, forest lands that are under forest management plans um, comes down to about 6%, uh, a $6 million um, shift um, out of that $744 million. About, um, we're at about a quarter of 1% as the way that it's calculated. Uh, from the 2004 bill, we get $3,000 from the state on the, on the AIM, the, the A2 municipalities um, from the state. So, you know, figuring out how, you know, are we taking on a tax burden on these things? Um, the, the short answer is no, because also under 480 or 480A, whenever land is logged, 6% of the stumpage comes back into the coffer. So, you know, the town of Chester brings in about another 14,000 or so on, on the stumpage on things. So, these are all some of the figures that, that go into calculating what effect does this uh, have or, or not. So, I just wanted to make sure that um, if before this board did any action on it that we all had all the facts we knew what this was about, what it meant, and what it meant to the county. The county, according to the Anka Forest study that came out several years ago, and they presented it at the Queensbury um, Hotel, shows that the timberlands within the county are about 300,000 acres. These these are mostly, it's like 90 some odd percent of those are uh, privately owned uh, lands. And uh, those would be the ones that would be eligible to be enrolled in a 480B uh, program. And when you look at the economy of our region, forestry is a big player. Dollar-wise, it may not be as much as tourism, but altogether, it supports quite a, quite a lot. Um, the idea behind this new uh, Empire Future Forest Initiative is to be able to have, uh, to maintain our working forests well into the future. And I know that's important for our community. I, while I was meeting with uh, the regional director on Friday and we're talking, about 15 log trucks go, go through town. Yeah. And we we get quite a lot of traffic through there. Um, and I, I could go on, but there's, so before this board is asked to, to do anything, it should be in support of something and, and not in, in opposition to. Uh, that's so would you support the version that's in front of the Senate or you're not familiar with it? It's the same, it's basically saying to, to pay up. Oh, so here's the thing. The town of Chester only needs to make up, enroll a few more people into this program. We'll hit the 1% and we'll have the full funding. And this is coming through, as Matt was pointing out, or did you point out, it's coming from the budget um, of the, the governor and it's not an add-in. Um, Senator Little had put it in through a, through a legislative add-on there years ago. So this is something that's coming through with that support of funding. All right, Supervisor Simpson. I just want to say that funding is important. In, in our area, we'll probably not have that effect that is drastic. But there are huge T-Mobiles just north of us that own large tracts of land, but they have half their property in 40 days, and they, they're considering what they're going to do with this new legislation, which we put in the 40 days. Um, and the background is, we haven't been made whole on all the other exemptions, and here we're coming up with a solution that still doesn't make us whole, and, and really can negatively impact some communities and positively impact some communities. So we're in a little bit, I, uh, I'm not seeing a real strong comfort level here among the committee people, uh, but it's part of the legislative process, so this thing is going to possibly get addressed um, uh, between now and April 1st, or thereabouts. <laughs> but... Yeah, John, that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is, uh, that's the point of this, is that there's a um, discussion, negotiation going on in Albany where 
mean, if we were asked today to do support the proposal that would shift any number, no matter the number, for a proposal that is the same program that shifts to zero, if we were for the good of the program and what it covers, we would say zero, right? But we are not part of that negotiation and that exchange. So, I mean, if you're to say, well, sure, I think I support the Senate version, of course, because there's no shift, right? On the other hand, the governor might be out there saying, well, but if you support the plan I have in front of you, I would be prepared to do the following. That part of the discussion, we're not party to. So there's no quid pro quo. There's no, to be able to say later, well, we supported the 1% shift because in exchange for that, we received X, Y, Z. And that's why whenever you get involved in the budget process and proposals, it becomes exceedingly difficult. I think the safest position from a municipal point of view is to support the Senate version, which is, well, fine, we're going to do it, but you have to put the money in to pay for it. And not above 1%, but all the money. And then let, and the merit behind that is when you do that, then what you're doing is you're empowering those people to go in and hammer out a strong, a strong arrangement, a strong, a strong thing. Whereas if you come down on the other side, then basically you're telling your state representatives not to forget about that, support the governor in this particular initiative. So it's kind of pick your poison, I guess is what I'm saying. All right, where are we? Supervisor Bramer? I agree with the chairman that we, obviously we would want the one that has full reimbursement, but if that puts the program at risk, you know, that they might then not pass 480B at all, that seems like it would be more negative to us, to our communities. I just don't know where we should, can we just support 480B and then not say anything about it? No. He's shaking his head no. Yes, Supervisor? Right now under the 480-488, you have a 80% reduction in the assessed value when it comes under a forest management plan. Under 480B, it's going to be a 40%. So the towns are not losing as much, losing as a, in quotes, because when you are protecting your natural resources that fuel your economy, you are basically supporting business. The way I see this is that it's a pro-business, pro-economy measure, that property taxes are a regressive tax. There, and this is, and the way that land is assessed, it's not on the resource value, it's on a market value for that land. Now, if you have a family land and you want to keep that as family land, you can enroll this into a 480B, 25 acres and up. And for that, you can ensure that it's easier to maintain that land through the ages. And it will be on a forest plan that will create a sustainable forest product throughout the years. Without that, and this is all voluntary, if you wanted to be a speculator, you could come in and buy a 100 acre of forested land that is not under forest management of the 480s. And buy it up, sell it off, and basically take that forest resource out of production for most practical purposes. So in the long term, this is part of a sustainable approach to our forest economy out here. So there's a lot of moving parts on this. And I really don't think we sitting here as a committee really have a full scope on it. If we were to come out here with the charts and I could pull together a PowerPoint, you'd really see how this all fits in. But just imagine, look at all the brouhaha that came out over the latest tax reform that came out of Washington. And everybody was for that because it reduced taxes in order to stimulate the economy. This whole empire, the EFI, E-F-F-I, is along those lines. That's the way I see it, is that it is something that can stimulate our business and make it more fair. It was brought up on how overtaxed the state is. And on real estate taxes, that's one of the big chunks. 
Um, this is just one effort that can make that playing field a little bit more level. Okay, yes. Just to, and I'm also hearing that the impact number is changing. I mean, I originally heard a number of 16 million. Now I'm hearing it north of 20. I mean, that's the other part of this that concerns me. I'm not exactly sure it's a stage. But I've seen a published number that, you know, everyone says, okay, well, that's that's how much it's going to be. That's the statute. Yeah, Supervisor Simpson. I was told in a meeting at DEC that under the 480 and the 48, there's already the south end was 16 and a half. I heard another conversation north of 20 million. That's local municipalities, school districts, and counties. There are already none. Now, there is no silver bullet that go back forward. That's why I think supporting the Senate bill is the right thing to do because if we end up with 480B being fully funded and no further exposure to legislation, but if you, you know, the, the big issue is 480B to the 480A. Well, the Association of Towns says in brief that it can support it, but it would like to see, I'm quoting, some amendments before we can support the initiative without reservation. And this is coming from the Association of Towns, representing, what, 935 towns in New York State? There's, also, there's also a piece of uh, legislation included in there that allows or to require notification of the amendment that we're talking about. Well, that would be the All right, well, and, you know, whereas in the town of Chester, you have to do that already. Yeah. Well, uh, I said <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Wild and the supervisor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, and I'm not sure if you guys even know, but it seems like you're getting a tax break if you put your property into these 480B and 480A, right? Is that something that came, like, goes on the deed that say it's forever going to be like this? Or no. they can swap in and out? No, there's a term. It's, it's different, but I liken it to like ag districts. Um, what it does is it, it, it allows smaller pieces of property, like if you own the minimum, 25, what's it, 25? 25 acres. 25 acres. It allows you to achieve a certain lower assessed value. Right. And so the concern will be, well, once you do that, then what you were paying in taxes gets shifted onto all the other taxpayers mm. for some period of time. <coughs> some people who make the argument, well, that's not that much money, and the state's going to pay about 1%. And some people are saying, well, the state should pay it no matter what it is, which is the Senate's version. And that's why I think uh, Supervisor Simpson is saying, well, if you support the Senate vision, you're in effect supporting the legislation, but you're also supporting the fact that the state these are small numbers for the state of New York. We can easily make them whole. But they may not be small numbers per municipality. That's the state below the tax cap. So, for example, if the municipality has got 2% uh, of some municipal budgets, might be about fourteen or $15,000. So if you start talking about a tax shift, you could be talking about a significant, I won't say huge, but a significant percentage of, of that within the tax cap. So, again, it's one of these issues that's going back and forth. I just one is that in the House version or is that excluded from the House version? The House uh, didn't present it in the bill. Yeah, I didn't think so. So the House, it gets kind of interesting because because the House, if the House was keen on it, they would have been in their budget bill. It's not in their budget bill, which tells me that they they could very well, I don't know definitively, but they could very well kind of agree with the Senate. They don't want to say it. And you got the governor in there uh, through DEC that wants something to happen. It would be nice, I think it would be a good thing to see it happen, I think, and I think the state should just make the municipality so whatever that is, whatever that cost is. Yeah. To, to answer Supervisor Lackett, yes. There. 
there is recapture. You put it into a program. If you pull out early, you have to make up what you did not make. All right, Supervisor Disco, I'm sorry. No, I'm up all set. Uh, where are we? Lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Bramer? Oh, I don't know. What do you th think about supporting the Senate version? I have no idea. I don't have that. I don't know. And I, part of me is thinking by the time we even get this up to full board, it's going to be over. We can take it up again after the budget. I mean, it's going to be over Thursday. It's going to be over Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I, I don't, I, I haven't seen the, you know, 480B version. And I like to read these documents. And even the Association of Towns says the 480B is not perfect. We need it amended. So I'm going to trust their version. I'm just not comfortable with going anywhere with this at this time. I think it was a worthy discussion item. Um, I know Mr. Simpson's going to be a little bit disappointed, but it was kind of brought to us late. It's not a simple thing. I'm not disappointed either. All right, okay. Okay, so uh, I'm sensing no action on this unless somebody speaks differently. Okay. Uh, anything else? <coughs> All right, a motion to adjourn. Moved by uh, Supervisor Wild, seconded by uh, Supervisor Sopo. All those in favor of adjourning, aye, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed to adjourning?